On November 22, 1963, John and Jackie Kennedy visited Dallas, where Lee Harvey Oswald shot and killed President Kennedy. Jackie became the world's most famous widow. While she was praised for her strength in public, in private, she was devastated. Here's what Jackie Kennedy did the year following JFK's death. Although John F. Kennedy was likely already dead when he arrived at Dallas's Parkland Memorial Hospital, doctors whisked him into Trauma Room 1 and tried chest compressions. Jackie refused sedatives and insisted on being with her husband. As a priest administered the last rites, she slipped her wedding ring onto his finger. A few weeks later, Life magazine reported that President Kennedy's assistant, Kenny O'Donnell, had retrieved the ring and returned it to Jackie, correctly believing that she might regret being without it. Kennedy's body was taken to Air Force One at Love Field Airport in Dallas, where new President Lyndon Johnson was waiting. He'd been advised to fly back to Washington, D.C. to be sworn into office officially, but refused to leave without Jackie, and she refused to leave without Kennedy's body. Johnson's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, gently asked Jackie if she'd like to change out of her blood-splattered clothing. Jackie told her no, saying, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. It was her idea to stand beside Johnson as he was sworn in. I will do my best. That is all I can do. According to Esquire, when O'Donnell asked if she was sure, she told him, I think I ought to. At least I owe that much to the country. Jackie wanted her husband's funeral to symbolically associate him with another slain president, Abraham Lincoln. Kennedy was laid in state in the Capitol's rotunda on November 24th on the same cattle falk that had been used for Lincoln's body in 1865. According to the White House website, 250,000 people visited to pay their respects. The next day, the casket was carried by Quezon to the White House. From there, Jackie decided that she and the children should walk behind it to Mass at St. Matthew's Cathedral. The journey also included a riderless horse with empty boots facing backwards and its stirrups, a symbol of a lost military leader. After Mass, Kennedy's body was transferred back to the Quezon for the journey back to Arlington Cemetery. You may have seen the famous photo of his son John Jr. saluting the casket. In footage showing the moment, you can see Jackie bending down to remind her son to salute his dad and say goodbye. Jackie had overcome much resistance to have an eternal flame installed at Arlington, which she, Bobby, and Ted Kennedy lit in turn. After the internment, she hosted a small reception back at the White House. Secret Service agent Clint Hill told Town & Country that Jackie and Bobby secretly visited the grave again at midnight, where she laid down her own small bouquet of flowers. The Johnsons refused to rush Jackie out of the White House and stayed in touch after she left. But Jackie didn't want to stay in the home that was so tied to Kennedy and the presidency. Initially, Jackie took the children to Cape Cod while staff packed up their stuff at the White House. They returned on December 2nd and moved out for good on December 6th to a house in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. that belonged to Under Secretary of State W. Averill Harriman. The house was only three blocks away from the house where she and President Kennedy had been living when he was elected. A couple of months later, Jackie bought a house across the road and had the decorator design the children's bedrooms to mimic the ones they had had at the White House. Despite numerous invitations from President Johnson and later Hillary Clinton, Jackie avoided the White House for almost the rest of her life. She even asked drivers to take routes away from it. She returned only once for a secret visit in 1971 at the request of President Richard Nixon to view the official portraits of her and Kennedy by Aaron Schickler and to take a tour with First Lady Pat Nixon. After Kennedy's death, Jackie was widely praised for the incredible grace and strength she showed to the world. Lady Bird Johnson, for example, was impressed and a little intimidated at how Jackie carried herself with so much poise under immense stress. In her diary from November 24th, Lady Bird recalled driving from the White House in a limousine with President Johnson, Jackie and her two children, and Bobby Kennedy, past weeping mourners lining the road. Lady Bird wrote that only the dignity of Jackie and her family prevented her from crying too. On January 14, 1964, Jackie addressed the nation in a newsreel, thanking them for the messages of condolence, which totaled nearly 800,000. In her message to the country, Jackie said, The knowledge of the affection in which my husband was held by all of you has sustained me. Jackie had been raised not to make a fuss in public, and according to Vanity Fair, she was irritated at the praise she received. Behind the scenes, she was, understandably, an emotional wreck. The crowds that gathered wherever she went scared her, and she didn't feel up to bearing the weight of a nation's grief coupled with her own and her children's. A few months before the one-year anniversary of the assassination, Jackie decided to leave Washington, D.C. for New York. She hoped that she would be able to escape the public attention that followed her in the nation's political capital. In the fall of 1964, she bought an apartment on the 15th of 17 floors and 1040 Fifth Avenue, next to Central Park. After a vacation to the coast of then Yugoslavia, she moved into the Carlisle Hotel in September while renovations on the apartment were underway. This wasn't your average New York apartment. 
Jackie's new home came with four bedrooms, two dressing rooms, a library, three staff bedrooms, a living room, a dining room, a conservatory, a wine room, five bathrooms, and two terraces. On her first day in the city, Jackie took Caroline and John Jr. rowing on the lake in Central Park. She tried to give them some normalcy and happiness since their father's death. The previous December, she'd put up Christmas lights and stockings, and she'd thrown John Jr. a belated party since JFK was buried on his son's third birthday. Moving to New York was a way for Jackie to live a relatively normal life for herself and her children without Secret Service agents constantly following. The one person who may have been as devastated by John F. Kennedy's death as Jackie was his brother and Attorney General Robert Kennedy, better known as Bobby. Their shared grief solidified an already close friendship, even before Kennedy's body was back in Washington. Esquire reports that when Air Force One landed with the newly sworn-in President Johnson and now former First Lady Jackie Kennedy on board, Bobby pushed his way onto the plane looking for Jackie and escorted her off ahead of the casket and of Johnson. They would later be the last two people to see John in his casket in the East Room of the White House and would make a private visit to his grave after the formal funeral. Jackie's personal assistant, Kathy McKeon, recalled that Bobby lived near Jackie's apartment in New York and often visited. However, Jackie's closeness with Bobby sometimes backfired. Although she moved to New York to escape public attention, the Kennedys persuaded her to make appearances in support of her former brother-in-law's Senate campaign, which he would go on to win. McKeon recalled that when Bobby was assassinated in 1968, Jackie was devastated, saying, quote, same story all over again. John F. Kennedy had been contemplating his presidential library since 1961. A month before his death, he'd chosen a site for it in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Harvard University. Less than a month after his death, Jackie joined members of his family to discuss the details of the library, which was ultimately built near the University of Massachusetts in Boston. While in the White House, Jackie had taken charge of a restoration project that aimed to return the residence to its former glory. She tracked down authentic period furniture, worked with renowned interior designers, and set up private foundations to fund her plans. She gave a televised tour of the newly revamped White House on Valentine's Day 1962, which was so popular it earned her an honorary Emmy. This room's interesting because it has the most architectural unity of any room in the White House. Given this previous success, it makes sense that Jackie's main contribution to the Kennedy Presidential Library was an aesthetic one. In 1964, she selected Chinese-born architect I.M. Pei, who was seen as an odd choice by some. Jackie stuck firm. Vanity Fair reports that she argued that just like JFK when he was elected president in 1960, Pei had a lot of potential. Jackie oversaw displays on family life in Kennedy's White House and was involved throughout the library's slow progress. The library finally opened in October 1979. One week after Kennedy's death, President Johnson appointed the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, better known as the Warren Commission after its chair, Chief Justice Earl Warren, to investigate. According to the National Archives, the committee heard testimony from 552 witnesses, including Jackie. On June 5, 1964, Jackie was interviewed at her home in Washington, D.C. by Warren, the Commission's General Counsel J. Lee Rankin and Robert Kennedy in his capacity as Attorney General. The testimony lasted 10 minutes. Jackie said the crowds in Dallas were very excited, and early in the route, Kennedy got out of the car to shake hands with a group of people. She said that she was looking to the left, away from Kennedy, when the first bullet hit him. That's what made her look round to see her husband holding his head. Then he collapsed onto her lap. Jackie didn't remember anything after that, including climbing onto the car, as can be seen in the footage. She also said, I used to think if only I had been looking to the right, I would have seen the first shot hit him. Then I could have pulled him down, and then the second shot would not have hit him. The Warren Commission concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman who killed Kennedy, but some people still argue there are bizarre things that never made sense about JFK's assassination. Jackie tried to control and avoid investigations into the details of Kennedy's assassination. She soon decided that she would authorize only one person to write an official account, William Manchester. Manchester was an author Jackie had yet to meet, but one who had written a flattering book about her husband. Manchester signed a contract that gave Jackie final say over the book, but she spoke to him only a few times before deciding that reliving the moment over and over was too painful. However, starting on March 2, 1964, Jackie spent over eight hours speaking to Kennedy's former aide and historian, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who was collecting interviews with people who had known Kennedy for his presidential library. The tapes were supposed to be sealed for 50 years, but in 2011, Jackie and John's daughter Caroline chose to publish them three years early. Unsurprisingly, Jackie had nothing but praise for her late husband. She recalled him reading constantly and his afternoon naps. She also didn't hold back on certain other historical figures. She called French President Charles de Gaulle a, quote, egomaniac, Martin Luther King Jr. a, quote, phony, and India's future Prime Minister Indira Gandhi a, quote, bitter, kind of pushy, horrible woman. 
Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.